Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. For the past couple of videos, we've been looking at molecular orbitals and their shapes and symmetries. Today, I want to tell you about the connection between MOs and spectroscopy. It turns out that MOs can tell us a lot about absorption spectra, and they also explain some of the fundamental magnetic properties of molecules. To begin, let's think about the energies of the molecular orbitals. We know the relative energies of atomic orbitals. For the most part, their energies follow the pattern described by the electron configuration. So, for example, 1s atomic orbitals have lower energy than 2s orbitals, and these have lower energy than 2p orbitals, and so on. But molecular orbitals are spread out over several atoms in a molecule. How can we predict the energy that an MO will have? It turns out that we can describe the formation of molecular orbitals and get a picture of their relative energies using what's called an energy level diagram. For example, let's draw the energy level diagram for the hydrogen molecule, H2. We start by imagining that the two atoms are not yet connected, so we draw an energy level for each atom, one on the right side and one on the left. The y-axis here is the energy of the orbital. Since the atomic orbital on each atom is identical, the two energy levels have the same position on the y-axis. We label each energy level with the name of the orbital. In this case, they're both 1s orbitals. Finally, we draw arrows representing the electrons on each energy level, similar to what we did when we drew orbital diagrams in video 21. Since each of these orbitals contains just one electron, we draw one arrow on each. Now we imagine that the two atoms are combined to form a molecule. As a result, the two atomic orbitals merge to form molecular orbitals. As we saw in the last video, the molecular orbitals are a linear combination of atomic orbitals. What that means is that we form the MOs by either adding wave functions representing the atomic orbitals or subtracting one from the other. As we saw in the previous video, the molecular orbitals we get by combining two 1s orbitals are a sigma g molecular orbital and a sigma u star orbital. However, these two orbitals don't have the same energy as the original 1s orbitals. And that's an important point. If the bonding orbital had the same energy as the atomic orbitals that formed it, there would be no reason for the bond to form. The reason we get a bond in the first place is because the bonding MO has a lower energy than the 1s atomic orbitals. That makes it more stable and energetically favorable than having two separated hydrogen atoms. What about the antibonding orbital? Well, the law of conservation of energy tells us that the energy of the orbitals has to be the same after we combine them as it was before we combined them. Therefore, since the sigma g orbital has a lower energy, the energy of the sigma u star orbital must be higher than that of the 1s orbital, by the same amount. The last thing we need to do is draw arrows in the molecular orbitals. There's a total of two electrons from the two atomic orbitals, so we'll put them in the MOs. We fill the MOs from the bottom up, so these electrons both go in the lower orbital. Remember, each orbital can hold no more than two electrons, and the Pauli exclusion principle tells us that those will have opposite spins, so we draw the arrows pointing in opposite directions. It turns out that in order for a chemical bond to be stable, the atoms must share more electrons in bonding orbitals than in antibonding ones. That's certainly the case here, where there are two electrons in a bonding MO and none in an antibonding one we can get a sense of just how stable a bond is using what's called the bond order. The bond order is given by taking the number of electrons in bonding MOs, subtracting the number in antibonding MOs, and dividing by two. The resulting bond order gives us a rough idea of whether the bond is a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond, or something in between as would be the case if the bond includes a delocalized electron that spreads out over several bonds. For example, the hydrogen molecule we've been looking at has two electrons in a bonding orbital and none in an antibonding orbital. 
That gives it a bond order of 1. That implies that the two hydrogens are connected by a single bond, which is indeed the case. By contrast, let's think about the MO diagram of a helium-2 molecule. Each helium atom has two 1s electrons, so the two atomic orbitals will look like this in the energy level diagram. Just as with the hydrogen molecule, the two 1s atomic orbitals combine to form a bonding and an antibonding orbital. This time, each 1s orbital contains two electrons, so there will be four electrons in the molecular orbitals. The first two go in the bonding orbital, and the next two go in the antibonding one. That gives us a bond order of zero, and that means there's no bond between the atoms. In other words, an HE2 molecule just doesn't exist. There is no such molecule. Next, let's look at two lithium atoms. Each atom has three electrons, two in a 1s orbital and one in a 2s orbital. As you know, the 2s orbital has a higher energy, so it goes higher on the y-axis. So, which of these orbitals combine to form MOs? Well, it turns out that atomic orbitals will only combine if their energies are similar. So, for example, the two 1s orbitals can combine, and the two 2s orbitals can combine. However, the energies of the 1s and 2s orbitals are too much different to allow one of each to combine and form a molecular orbital. That means we'll get these molecular orbitals when the lithium atoms bond. Once again, we get a sigma g orbital and a sigma u star orbital for the two 1s atomic orbitals. What about the 2s orbitals? Well, since they have the same symmetry as the 1s orbitals, they'll combine to give us the same kinds of molecular orbital. Now we just fill in the molecular orbitals with arrows. Since we have a total of 6 electrons, here's what we get. Next, let's look at a larger system, a nitrogen molecule, N2. A nitrogen atom has the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. That means that the atomic orbital energies will look like this. Notice that the 2p orbitals have a higher energy than the 2s orbitals, as we'd expect. Also, notice that there are three lines representing the three different 2p orbitals. All three of them have the same energy but we draw them slightly separated on the y-axis just to make it easier to tell that there are three orbitals there. The last thing to notice is that we draw the three electrons in the 3p orbitals using arrows all pointing in the same direction. As you might recall from video 21, Hund's rule tells us that when we add electrons to orbitals with the same energy, each orbital is occupied by one electron before any of the orbitals gets a second electron. That's what we're seeing here. There are three orbitals, so each of them gets an electron. Since none of the orbitals contains a pair of electrons, none of the spins needs to be paired. Now let's think about how the atomic orbitals combine to form molecular orbitals. The 1s and 2s orbitals form MOs, just like the ones we've seen previously. However, the 2p orbitals will be different. As we saw in video 27, the two pz orbitals combine to form a sigma bond, while the px and py orbitals form pi bonds. But sigma and pi bonds have different energies. A sigma bond has a lower energy than a pi bond, so the energies of the bonding MOs look like this. Notice that there are two pi bonds, one from the two px orbitals and one from the two py orbitals, and these have the same energy. Just as in the previous examples, we must obey the law of conservation of energy. So just as these bonding orbitals have a lower energy than the original atomic orbitals, the antibonding orbitals have a corresponding higher energy. Notice that this means that although the pi bonding orbitals have a higher energy than the sigma bonding orbital, the antibonding pi orbitals have a lower energy than the antibonding sigma orbital. Notice what the bond order will be for this system. 
there are 10 electrons in bonding orbitals and 4 in antibonding orbitals. That gives us a bond order of 3, which implies that the atoms are connected by a triple bond, which is indeed the case for the nitrogen molecule. Finally, let's look at one more example, an oxygen molecule, O2. This is very similar to the nitrogen molecule we just looked at, but with one important difference. Oxygen has one more electron than nitrogen, so the atomic orbitals look like this. When these combine to form MOs, we get an energy level diagram that looks just like the one for nitrogen. When we fill in the electrons, here's what we get. But notice what we got in the upper orbitals. The pi g star orbital isn't completely full, so the electrons in it are unpaired. They all have the same spin. This is actually the first example we've looked at that has an MO that isn't either completely full or completely empty. So why is that significant? It turns out that if a molecular orbital contains unpaired electrons, that makes the molecule magnetic. And in fact, oxygen is a magnetic compound. Since it's a gas at room temperature, the molecules move too quickly to be noticeably attracted to a magnet. But if we cool the oxygen so that it liquefies, we can definitely see the attraction between the liquid oxygen and a powerful magnet, as you can see in this video. MO diagrams can also give us information about the behavior of a molecule when it undergoes a chemical reaction. For example, let's look again at this energy diagram for an oxygen molecule. It turns out that the electrons in the MOs that arise from the highest atomic orbitals are the valence electrons, and the electrons in MOs from lower orbitals are the core electrons. Also, it turns out that most chemical reactions involve one of two different processes. The first process is removal of electrons from the highest occupied molecular orbital, or HOMO. In this case, the HOMO is the pi g star orbital. The other process that happens in a chemical reaction is adding electrons to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or LUMO. In this case, that's the sigma mu star orbital. So, chemical reactions involving an oxygen molecule will usually involve removing an electron from the pi g star orbital or adding electrons to the sigma mu star orbital. And some chemical reactions can involve both, as we'll see in a moment. Molecular orbital diagrams also have implications in spectroscopy. A molecule absorbs light if the light wave has an energy exactly corresponding to the energy difference between the HOMO and the LUMO. However, there's one catch. In order for the light to be absorbed, the symmetry of the beginning and ending orbitals must be different. In other words, if the HOMO is Girard, then the LUMO must be Ungirard, or vice versa. In this example, the HOMO is a Girard orbital, and the LUMO is Ungirard, so it is possible for a photon to be absorbed and cause the electron to move from one orbital to the other. So far, you might have noticed that we've just been looking at homonuclear molecules, where both atoms are identical. Let's see what happens if we have a heteronuclear diatomic molecule. For example, consider a hydrogen fluoride molecule, HF. Hydrogen features one electron in a 1s orbital, while the fluorine has the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. That means their atomic orbitals will look like this. However, this time we need to be careful. In previous examples, the two atoms were the same, so we knew that the atomic orbitals of the same type would have the same energy for both atoms. For example, in nitrogen, the 2p orbitals of one nitrogen atom had the same energy as the 2p orbitals of the other nitrogen. But in a heteronuclear molecule, that's not necessarily the case. For example, in the HF molecule, it's not true that the 1s orbital of hydrogen has the same energy as the 1s orbital of fluorine. That's important. Because, as I mentioned earlier, atomic orbitals can only combine to form an MO if their energies are similar. 
So, in order to draw the energy level diagram for a heteronuclear molecule, we need to know the energies of the atomic orbitals of the individual atoms. To get those, we need to look them up in a reference. For example, if we do that for hydrogen and fluorine, we find out that the energy of a hydrogen 1s orbital is negative 13.6 electron volts. Meanwhile, for fluorine, the 2p orbital has an energy of negative 18.6 electron volts, the 2s orbital is negative 40.2 electron volts, and the 1s orbital has an energy so low it's actually difficult to measure. However, it's much, much lower than negative 40.2 electron volts. Now that we know that, we can draw a more accurate energy level diagram. Remember, the y-axis is the energy, so we'll put the atomic orbitals at the appropriate height in the diagram. Now that we've done that, we can see what's going to happen. Remember, atomic orbitals can only combine if their energies are similar. In this case, that means the 1s orbitals of the two atoms definitely don't mix. Instead, the 1s orbital of hydrogen will combine with a 2p orbital from fluorine. But the hydrogen orbital can only combine with one of the p orbitals. Which one of the three will it be? Well, remember what the p orbitals look like. The pz orbital has a lobe pointing along the bond toward the hydrogen orbital. The lobes of the px and py orbitals are perpendicular to the bond axis. However, the wave function of a p orbital has a negative value in one lobe and a positive value in the other lobe. That means if one of these orbitals tries to combine with the hydrogen 1s orbital, there will be both a bonding region and an antibonding region at the same time. On the other hand, the pz orbital can form an entirely bonding orbital with hydrogen, so that's the orbital that will form the bond. The bond that we form is a sigma bond, so that's how we label the MO. It has a lower energy than either of the atomic orbitals, which is why the bond forms at all. However, that means there must also be an antibonding molecular orbital, whose energy is just as much higher than that of the atomic orbitals. Now, what about the electrons in the orbitals that don't combine with hydrogen 1s orbitals? Well, since none of them mix with the hydrogen, their energies don't change. Therefore, we just draw their energy levels at the same height they started with. Those orbitals aren't involved in a bond at all, so they're neither bonding nor antibonding orbitals. Instead, they belong to a third class of orbital called non-bonding orbitals, which we indicate using a superscript NB. Finally, we'll fill in the energy levels with arrows representing the 10 electrons in the system. So that's the MO diagram for this molecule. Now let's take a second to think about what each of the occupied MOs means. Of course, the sigma orbital shared by the two atoms represents the bond, which contains two electrons. What about these electrons? Notice that there are four electrons here, or two pairs. These, plus the electrons in the highest occupied s orbital, are the electron pairs we usually draw in a Lewis dot structure. Well, that's enough new material for now. When we meet again, we'll take one more look at MOs, this time applying what we've learned to even larger molecules. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.